lot of my poems are in the voice of a character other than than me. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to read a number of those. Uh, the, the first one is in the voice of Casper uh, Hauser, who you may or may not know. He was found wandering around on the streets of Nuremberg in 1828, um, sort of in a daze. And over the days and weeks, it turned out that he'd been confined. He was about 16 years old. He'd been confined all of his life to a small room in the basement of a building somewhere. I'm not sure they ever figured out exactly where it was. Uh, he had a letter in his hand. He knew a couple of words, um, but really only a couple. And one of the things that the letter said was, I want to be a glorious writer, just like my father before me. Nobody ever figured out what that meant, but anyway, that's the title of this poem. I want to be a glorious writer, just like my father before me. But was that writer really my father? Was that me, all alone for years, alone in the lightless basement, adrift, amid the dark stars. I had no picture books, nor light by which to read them. But I imagined the book, the idea of the book, and now I want to write one. This next poem is in the voice of a replicant. It sort of turns on the fact that replicants don't really have mothers. They're the product of bioengineering. I mean, they, they pass for human beings, but they're, and they are in a way, but anyway, that's sort of a puzzle whether they are or, or they aren't. Anyway, it's called, they were sort of designed for outer space missions. This is called Off World. My mother never told me I was a replicant. Did yours? Don't mean to pry, but I get stir-crazy whenever I take one of these jaunts off-world. Happens every time, no matter how wide, how open, the wide open spaces, how frequent and various the, con the contacts with other sentient creatures. It's the same old story, the story with an end, but no beginning, no middle. So let's talk about timelessness or maybe shortcuts to wisdom. Got any new ones? Have you, in other words, been zoning out the way they train you to? None of my business, of course, but what happened to your startle reflex? Went the way of valor, huh? Or the better part of it, oh, and I heard about that dust up off the sh shoulder of Orion. At least they gave you a medal for your trouble. But what do they give us for the numbness that tries to pass itself off as professionalism, the self-referential kind, that keeps adding circuits until voila, that workable simulacrum of human consciousness they're always promising to revamp, and I know and you know how that can slow you down, scramble the reflex imprints, but don't know about you, but I only rarely bypass it because, you know, Consciousness, it's a big part of being alive. Not the better part, I grant you, but what else could maintain the cognitive skills that replicate the experiential cues that trigger the, uh, that trigger the updates of my memories of mother? Um, the epigraph to Edgar Allan Poe's uh, murders in the Rue Morgue is this. What song the sirens sang or what name Achilles assumed when he hid himself among women, though puzzling questions are not beyond all conjecture. 
That's from a, a piece of writing called Hagiotaphia by Thomas Brown. It's from the mid 17th century. And this next poem is in the voice of Thomas Brown, but a few years after he wrote that, because now he's figured out the answers to these questions. The title of this poem is I Know What Songs the Sirens Sang. I know what songs the sirens sang and what Philly Gatsby bet on in the fifth at Santa Anina on one of his infrequent jaunts to California. I know the name by which Achilles came and went when he lived among women. Gertrude, if you can believe that. I know where the light goes when it goes out. I know what words mean, but only as they are spoken and the light returns. You know that Thetis left Achilles' heel unbathed in the waters of the Styx, but I know why. She was distracted by the darkness beyond the river and her fear of what she heard is silence. I know that it was noise that knew not how to be heard, for I know what the silence says, all its talk of its vulnerability to hope, to the sexy gibberish of celebrity culture, to the songs the sirens are aiming even now at the heel of silence, and at all our heels. I know how long a shot it is, how long a shot is every song. So fearful are we of hearing it, of ending up in a rage or in love on the rocks or still grappled to the mask. And I know in this Stygian silence how murky is the choice between these and all your other fates. Uh, the character I'm impersonating in the next one is, is Henry James. Uh, I think he's very great, but I'm not a fan. <laughs> Uh, in the 19th century, a British politician said the American Constitution was all sail and no anchor. I'd say in this poem that uh, Henry James's prose is all anchor and no sail. <laughs> Not really fair. I mean, I, I, he, is, he is very great. Um, and there is a kind of issue of constitutionality here because I think you know, you have Henry James on one side and Hemingway on the other, sort of battling over which constitutes the idea of the serious novel in America. Um, anyway, Henry James crossing the Delaware. Having suspended suspense, I know how oratund my victory will be. It will be the victory of oratundity the defeat of all that I adulate at the hands of an adulation too polysyllabic to be mine alone. It belongs as well to the language I have invented. All anchor, no sail, the great galleon of my language arrived in the old world long before embarkation. Its, balanced, its ballast was ceremony, was and still is, the soothing hand of ceremony and a certain density of feeling that depends for its implication on dependent clauses, parenthetical insinuations, nearly untraceable allusions, many but not an infinite number, for my safe harbor will never be the sublime, will always be the beautiful residing in a night sky, masked by leaves and branches fleshing out a garden more entangled than genealogy and yet orderly, nonetheless, to eyes alive, to nuance, dead to the opportunities the new world snatches from the jaws of its sky blue emptiness. This next poem is very short. It's three very short lines. It's in the, in the, in the voice of Jackson Pollock. It's called Hi Bill. Bill is Willem de Kooning. Hi, Bill. It's Jack. Call me. 
It's about the imbrication. <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking that anachronism is sort of the key to poetry. I mean, no one in Pollock's time used the word imbrication. It came into art criticism sometime in the 70s. And uh, also, they didn't have answering machines in those days. Uh, <laughs> This is in the, in the voice of uh, Pinocchio, after he turns into flesh and blood. How charming I was when I was a puppet. Mischievous, I was obedient to my nature, which aspired to the sprezzatura of pots and pans of burrowing animals, and the eagle who wonders why the new regime can't just leave him alone. He doesn't want to adorn its escutcheon any more than I wanted to memorize the lines of a silly play for children. So the puppeteer had to memorize them for me, leaving me to dream of the will, how its determinants are never precisely aimed, what, is, what ensues after frantic readjustments is anarchy which applies so much elbow grease to nothing in particular that everything reassuring is transmogrified. Thus I am the boy of flesh and blood you see before you now, the sullen fugitive on whom everything is blamed, inflation and bad taste and the extinction of a warbler whose name I can't remember, and war and the collapse of the by then old regime, anything unchanged was simply misplaced, including the will and even the faintest hope of charm. I'm not quite sure this next one <clears throat> is called Parataxis Dreams. Parataxis is a rhetorical figure of in the words of Donald Judd describing his own work, one thing after another. In other words, just a, a number of things, potentially an infinite series of things, just connected by a conjunction, and, usually. So it's x and, x and y and z and so on, with, no, with nothing in the structure of parataxis to suggest where it might come to an end or how it might have a, a determined or determinate form. So this is in the, in the uh, voice of an uh, ancient Greek sophist like Gorgias or someone like that. Parataxis dreams that life might one day turn out to be a toy train at the scale of the universe. See the idea is that it, there's no end to adding to a toy train, at least in theory. A toy train at the scale of the universe with no end to adding new cars. And if most are empty, well, so what? It's just a toy train. A childish thing I will never put away because how would I ever know how? Knowledge is partial. Prophecy is erroneous by nature. And so how could I ever know even when the train will arrive? How could I ever know where it is going? These are childish questions I will never stop asking any more than parataxis will ever rest. Because even if it does nothing, the gravel driveway will, read, will, will lead to something other than itself. Everything will do likewise. The train that bore us from the storybook to this moment, that train will never stop running. This is a little vague, just like the last one. Uh, I mean, the voice that, it, <laughs> that it's in. I'm not quite sure who to attribute it to. The author of the, one, of, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers or somebody who thinks about constitutions. Um, <clears throat> there was nothing I had not yet said. And if I continue to talk, it may well have been in answer 
to the silence masquerading as thunder. Distant, but always apropos of the sunlight, falling like wintry confetti, warming the mottled stone in celebration of its indifference to common sense. Caught up in this spectacle, I neglected the dignity of my being and even my chance to vote for the amendments that might have protected it. So it is to you, constitutional process, that I offer this, <clears throat> this last full measure, measure of my devotion, and I am prepared to wait forever here in the darkness generated with increasing efficiency by your ongoing breakdown for you to accept this offer of mine, heartfelt and only on occasion utterly hopeless. The next, did I say that was the next to last poem? I'm going to read one more before the very last. It's called Punchinello and the, and the Sphinx. Punchinello is one of the figures in the Commedia dell'arte. He's the sort of buffoon. Um, you know, there's Harlequin, there's Pierrot, there's Columbine, and, and uh, he's, well, I guess it's best to say he's sort of a buffoon. Uh, who who always plays a crucial but usually unintended part in the plot. Punchinello and the Sphinx. Arnold Bennett, th Ar Arnold Bennett thought of me as a real person, but I'm just a fiction dreamt up by everyone. Thus, no one's responsibility. I am neglected like a public playground in a neighborhood left over from my not all that formative early years. Not that I lack character traits. I play the violin to no discernible purpose. I indulge in cocaine. I live in a large house on Long Island Sound and weave like a porpoise through the air and the water, through fire like a lovelorn salamander. But I'm just a sack stuffed with straw, and after a morning's romp with three of the four elements, I must lie on the beach all afternoon amid the other sea rack in the hope of drying out, and then I may wander on the beach at sunset in search of my original shape, as if I had one. Who is Arnold Bennett? Is that your question? Ask yourself sincerely. Do you care? And these mysteries that I solved, do you really care who turns out to have done it? Are you not drawn along, rather, by the clatter of hooves in a reassuring labyrinth? Uh-oh, got to run. The Sphinx is sailing through the dusk to meet me. Or she is the dusk, a monument made of paper mache. Weirdly translucent, she inspires the thought that if I had a mother, I would hurt her feelings by admitting if anyone like you were ever to ask that of the two, my mother and the Sphinx, I think the Sphinx is prettier. The last poem is called The Opportunist. Actually, this, this is to Phyllis, and it's in, in my voice. The Opportunist. You were there. I took the opportunity to see you. There was not only the light, but the air. I breathed as well as saw, and as you spoke, and the air became sound waves, I couldn't help but listen. Say that I eavesdrop, even when I am the one you talk to, and what can I say except, what is the world but an array of opportunities, so many that they hide one another and get lost, and we call the world the valley of shadows or a veil of tears. Nor is that entirely wrong. You vanished, giving me the, an opportunity to weep, an opportunity not taken, and happily you returned. And certain shadows took the opportunity to be yours. So I'm not the only one to see advantages in happenstance, nor are you the only one to profit from all this opportunism. Because who can deny that the world becomes a better place 
when night sees in you an opportunity to make itself more glamorous, and glamour takes me as an opportunity to make the world a more logical place, as in, if I adore you, then you are adored. If then, as the virtue of any beautiful structure, an architrave, a clavicle, thus, if we love one another, then we take one another to bed, how can we not? And afterward, you having left the bed, how can I not take this fresh vanishing as an opportunity to turn sorrow into sleep, sleep into dream, dream into an opportunity to forget it entirely upon waking, though I think I dreamt about you, the warmth you return to the sand, the sun has taken the opportunity to warm, or the moon to cool, and I am too sleepy to be sure and my uncertainty becomes the sheer opportunism of continuing to breathe. Thank you.